I realized that um, a section of the Royal Food Company Limited, uh, a food manufacturing company near CCC at Aija, had been engulfed with um, a fire. So looking at the um, nature of the fire, we quickly had to call in five additional um, fire engines, including a water tanker. Um, which um, came to also augment firefighting. Um, we realized that the fire was concentrated at a section where they had um, a lot of these um, chemicals that is used in manufacturing these home uh, products. Uh, and therefore, we quickly had to deploy our extinguishing medium, which includes the chemical foam compound, and then the water as well. But the challenge that we had to go through um, at the fire scene was um, inadequate or lack of continuous water supply due to the lack of uh, fire hydrant within the premises and it enclave. So we had to be uh, moving to PNUSD to replenish our fire engines. So look at the tool on the fire engines, the amount of fuel that we had to consume in and out to um, get water to the fire scene. And then also, due to the toxic and then the highly flammable um, materials that were on fire, we had to use about 20 pounds of foam compounds to be able to um, kettle or to extinguish the fire. So at exactly 20, 00, 00 hours, we had to bring the fire under control. And at um, 20, 30 hours, the fire was completely um, down. But uh, let me be quick to add that while we were busy um, fighting this hellish fire. Some of the media outlets were also giving us a very bad reportage, which was um, creating a whole lot of fear and panic in the um, system. We would want to use your platform to advise that um, we are the professionals. When mm. we get to the fire scene and we are managing um, such a, an inferno of that magnitude, we would want the media people who come around to seek um, um, information from our corporate quarters so that they can be well informed so that they will not throw dust into the uh, the eyes of the public so that we could um, also have the peace of mind to do the work. At the point in time, whilst um, our people were struggling to even locate the seat of fire, where some of them had to even um, be battered with heat and all that, we had to sustain and revive some of them to even continue with the firefighting. So it has not been easy this evening. Okay. Um, combatant this fire. Right. We are, we are grateful for this quick update you have given us, and uh, we thank you for the, uh, the, the work that you're doing with your team there. So the latest information is that the fire has been doused and the issue is under control. Investigations have begun uh, to find out the cause of that fire. We'll keep an eye on it. Hopefully uh, tomorrow we'll have a better and clearer picture as to what happened in the Ashanti region. Our correspondents are keeping a, clean, a keen eye on that story. Let's come to Accra now and um, the president's nominee uh, for the position of municipal chief executive for the Takwa Insuayim Municipal Assembly has been confirmed, although some eligible assembly members were uh, allegedly prevented from taking part in the exercise which happened on Friday, which is today. The 22 aggrieved assembly members have threatened to go to court over the process, which uh, they say is illegal. The 22 assembly members were allegedly prevented from taking part in the confirmation exercise of Municipal Chief Executive MCE nominee Benjamin Kessie by heavily armed policemen. As, as early as 6.30, no matches our program, you have to say. Now, no point you know, you have more assembly members, 22, and my crime, you have to say, you have to say, you have to say, you we were supposed to start at 8 a.m., but they started at 6 a.m. I was beaten mercilessly and prevented from taking part. The MCE nominee was, however, confirmed on Friday by 90% of assembly members present. He had 19 yes votes and two no votes. 21 out of the total of 43 members of the assembly participated in the confirmation exercise. Before his nomination, he was rejected three times by the assembly in his bid to become the presiding member of the assembly. 
Earlier, six groups in the Takwa Insuyem municipality had questioned the basis for the nomination of Benjamin Kesi when he had been rejected three times by the assembly. Benjamin Kesi replaces Gilbert Kennedy Asma, who was recently declared the best performing MMDCE in the Western region. Let's stay on this subject matter for a while. Um, it was actually really heated uh, earlier today when we started getting reports from Takwa in Shayim. Let's go to Skype now. And here's a bit of a background because uh, it looks like other key stakeholders are also commenting on this. The Chamber for Local Governance, that is Chalog, says it has noted with grave concern the rumble style manner in which the municipal chief executive of the Takwa Insuayim Municipal Assembly, Benjamin Kesey, was confirmed by a deliberately selected number of assembly members. Chalog wishes to condemn in no uncertain terms the brutality meted out to 23 honorable um, members, including the presiding member, who were further prevented by the police from entering the assembly hall to participate in the voting for the confirmation of MCE nominee. Chalog says it will, in the coming days, take the necessary steps or actions to assist the brutalized assembly members whose fundamental human rights have been abused to seek legal redress to possibly pray the courts to nullify the confirmation of the president's nominee for MCE for the Takwa Insuaye Municipal Assembly. So we have been joined by an executive member of Chalog, and I will just pick his thoughts shortly. Um, Dr. Richard Fiadomo is the president of the Chamber for Local Governance. Uh, Mr. Fiadomo, thank you for your time and good evening to you. If you can hear me. Yeah, good evening. Good evening to all your Chinese viewers as well. Right, to start with, I mean, um, why do you take a position on this? Uh, the president constitutionally has done what is expected. He nominates, then his nominee is voted for. Is that not what has happened? despite these skirmishes? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, the president has done what he has to do. And what is left is for the assembly members to also confirm the president's nominee. And what has happened is that some assembly members were deliberately stopped or prevented from participating in an activity which they are bona fide members of the House and they have every right to be part of it. And to prevent them from taking part in such an important exercise that is what we have kicked against, and we think that the action of the original minister was very irresponsible to the extent that he is the chairman of RESEC, and he has used the Security Council to stop the assembly members from doing what they have been elected to do. You don't, you don't, have, you don't, have, you don't have evidence to that effect, that he used the Security Council to stop the assembly members from you know, exercising their franchise. My brother, the video that you yourself just showed, you saw the security men preventing the assembly members. But they were not there on the to... orders of the, uh, you know, like you're saying, the assembly member, the, I beg your pardon, the regional minister. My brother, the regional minister was there. And he came, if we have 43 assembly members going to confirm an MCE, of what business do we have over 100 security uh, policemen coming to guide? In any case, what normally happens is that the presiding member will just summon assembly members mm. to a meeting to confirm the MC. Okay. So under normal circumstances, the assembly members should have been seated even before the dignitaries come in. Mm. But we don't have a situation whereby you give the assembly members 8 o'clock and then you go and start the exercise at 6 a.m. Of what importance or what is the need for the assembly not to wait from 8 o'clock to have the exercise and they have to push it to 6 a.m. Mm. Now that you've brought it to 6 a.m., you have not given the opportunity to those who are giving 8 o'clock to participate. Now they come and you have security men at the gate and they will not allow them in. And this is a wanton abuse of power by the regional minister and the rest of and we think that this is most, most unfortunate. Okay, uh, quickly, if you can help us also, what are you really seeking to achieve? Is it that you want to get the nominee uh, overturned, or you just want to seek help the assembly members who couldn't, you know, uh, vote. You want to seek redress, help them seek redress. Which of these two are you seeking to do? Well, what we are seeking to do, number one, their fundamental human rights have been abused. Why would you go and brutalize and assault assembly members when they are bona fide members of the assembly and they have every right to vote? Okay. In preventing them. And what they seek to do was just to abuse 
Section 21 of the Local Governance Act because they thought that once they did that, those who were present and voting will give their nominee what he has to get. But we think that if you are not careful, in, in the future we'll see some of this thing happening. And when a government comes into place and he thinks that some assembly members maybe are not sympathetic to whoever the president has nominated, they will not allow them to participate in the right. exercise. I think that is something we want to prevent in the not too distant future. Thank you so much for making time to speak with us. Um, Dr. Richard Fiadomo is the president of the um, Chamber for Local Governance, Chalok. This is News at 10 on TV3. Stay with us. We have more stories to come. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is News at 10. Let's go on to some other stories now, health-related. The fight to end uh, obstetric fistula, one of the most serious and tragic injuries that can occur during childbirth, could be threatened by the current pandemic of COVID-19. Obstetric, obstetric fistula is preventable. It can be largely uh, be avoided by delaying the age of first pregnancy, the cessation of harmful traditional practices, and timely access to obstetric care. And based on the fact that we are in a period where everything uh, of health is of concern to all, we want to find out how we can better manage this particular issue. And we've been joined by Skype by Dr. Gabriel Yaokuma Ganyaglo, a fistula surgeon, and uh, to pick his thoughts on how better, or how the issue can be better handled in this particular period of COVID-19. Good evening, Doc, and thank you for your time. Good evening, and uh, good evening to your viewers. We know that uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus has impacted almost everything, uh, majority of it negatively. For issues concerning um, obstetric fistula, what kind of impact is COVID-19 having on it currently in Ghana? Yeah, that's a very good question, and particularly for the times we are in. Um, yes, COVID-19 social distancing has been one of the strongest uh, recommendations to avoid getting the infection. Pregnant women who have to go for antenatal care will have to often use public transport, but how do you maintain social distancing in public transport? These were some of the challenges that came to the mind of pregnant women at the beginning of the pandemic. So many had to resort to going by a drop or take a taxi, charter a taxi to the clinic. So it's increasing the cost of visiting the clinics. Then you get into the clinics and the procedures have changed remarkably to accommodate the strict hand hygiene protocols, the masking, and then again, social distancing. And uh, you find that the staffs have also been reassigned and readjusted just to uh, mitigate the risk of acquiring the infection. So yes, COVID in itself or its wake brought us some adjustments to life and it could be on the, it could be heavy on the pockets of some of our clients. Mm. We are aware that, where, especially where fistula is concerned, nearly 68% of our patients who get fistula initially try to deliver at home. Mm. And so they were not deciding to go to hospital at all. We do have concerns that COVID-19 may be another layer of excuse for them not going to deliver in hospital. But it is a fact that generally in this country, antenatal care is almost 100%, mm. but supervised delivery or delivery supervised by a skilled bed attendant is far from uh, 100. It's just Doc, about 80%. Yes. Yes. Can you help us with numbers here and uh, how many, how, how, how rampant is the issue of uh, obstetric fistula in Ghana? And how many women estimatedly would you say? suffer from this condition? Thank you very much. That's a very good question to ask. We still have obstetric fistula as a maternal health issue in this country. Um, because the patients are largely stigmatized and ostracized and they are in hiding, they are not very easy to count. Mm. But we know that from what we did in 2015, for every year, we have about 1,353 new cases of obstetric fistula occurring. I'm referring to new cases. Wow. It's difficult to tell exactly how many are already living with fistula mm. in Ghana. And so 
Every year we also make the effort and we repair about 100 fistula patients because the resources and the time constraints uh, limit how much we can actually do mm. in terms of fistula repair. So putting our repair rate together with the incidence rate, you find that there's a significant backlog of women and girls living in this country who have obstetric fistula. Mm. All right, my final question to you would be how can we prevent this from happening? I mean, lots of women listening or lots of expectant mothers listening now, what can they do to prevent it? Or it is something you cannot do much about, just that when it happens, you can seek medical uh, help. No, there is something we can actually do a lot about. Obstetric fistula is largely preventable and treatable. Preventing obstetric fistula, it's, the issues are cross-cutting. You need girl-child education to be uppermost. Let's help the girls to go to school, particularly in rural areas. When we talk of girl-child education, most people in the metropolitan areas don't appreciate that so much. But go to rural Ghana and you see the disparities in how boys and girls are raised or even treated. So let's try and get the girls to go to school, learn some biology, and then appreciate or understand a bit about themselves. Mm -hmm. Then an educated girl is likely to be gainfully employed and have the economic muscle or even the financial wherewithal to actually negotiate her rights in a marriage relationship. As it is now, most of them lose control, and it is the men who take decisions concerning their pregnancy, where they go to labor, whether they go to hospital or not. Right. It is, you know, so those are very difficult situations. So girl-child education and family planning. If we can avoid the pregnant or make sure that the pregnancy that will lead to fistula is wanted in the first place, then I think that's a very big step. But to start to see women as late as 38, 39, coming to have their 10th child or 11th child and developing a fistula out of that. This mm. is clearly preventable. Mm. So family planning is also a very important intervention to prevent fistula from happening. Mm. And we must improve the quality of care in hospitals and encourage all our women to deliver in hospital because if the delivery is attended by a skilled birth attendant, mm. then when the labor is obstructing, it's likely to be seen and the appropriate interventions will be offered to the woman. So we can largely prevent obstetric fistula. Okay. I actually said that was my last question, but just before we know, I know that the 23rd of May has been set aside as World Fistula Day. What are we doing in Ghana? How are we marking the day? Yeah, today we had um, a webinar on maternal health workshop, I mean the maternal health workshop organized by the UNFPA. We are also engaging our friends in the media like we're doing now and trying to uh, increase awareness on obstetric fistula and advocate for people who have the muscle or the financial wherewithal to help also to care or treat for these patients. Mm. Tomorrow we are marking another virtual event with the gender health globally and the West African sub-region in particular. And that continues in the evening with another program from the UNFPA in uh, Mozambique. Next week, we still have a number of media, and enga media engagements. But because of the COVID-19 situation, most of the activities have gone virtual and may not be clearly visible to everyone, except those who are connected through your media networks. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yao. Let me get the full proper title right so I do not... Uh decrease your rank. Dr. Gabriel Yaokuma Ganyaglo, a fistula surgeon at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Thank you so much for your time and uh, giving us some further education. All right, uh, we've been speaking uh, with Dr. Yaokuma uh, Gabriel Ganyaglo and uh, clearly the concerns are many but the point I pick from this is almost always seek medical assistance especially when you're pregnant. This is News at 10 on TV3. We have more news on our website 3news.com. If you do visit you will get a lot more updates. That's it for the news at 10. I am Martin Esiri Dati. Do have a good evening. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. Wear your nose mask. And I'll catch you later. Bye for now.